by Malcolm Shiyuna. Yep. He is a writer, a podcaster, uh, and also a henchman slash mercenary to um, the Sweden Democrats in uh, in the uh, great, great land of Sweden. Uh, and also um, kind of a, a nebulous figure that's uh, intertwined with a lot of um, populist movements on the so-called left, maybe a bit more on the right. Uh, he is a, um, a, a very interesting figure and well, probably one of my favorite political commentators uh, who is maybe not still nominally on on the left? It's it's it's, it's a it's a strange place to be. So, thank you for joining me today, Malcolm. Thank you. Uh, I mean, I finally sort of gotten over this connection to the left. It takes a long time. Like you get cancelled, and then you go like, oh, but you guys, you're the meanies, and like if you only listen to me, it, it's kind of. You kind of you kind of learn that this is kind of like uh, being kicked out of a cult. There's actual sort of phases to it, and once you leave, you enter this phase called throwing rocks at the cathedral, which is where you're sort of sort of totally invested in denouncing all of these reactionaries and the lies and so on. Uh, and then you're stuck in the throwing rocks at the cathedral cathedral phase for a couple of years. But at this point, I'm kind of out of that purgatory. And now I can just say, you know, oh, well, good luck leftists. Um, their problems are no longer mine. Is there any label that you identify with currently? I would say, uh, I, I use this term on Chris Buskirk's show, uh, a non-denominational populist. So that kind of ties into why I have a feat both or, or a foot both in the camp of this sort of America first nationalist populist rights, uh, both in the US and in Europe, and sort of people that come from the left originally who want to do the same sort of populist, like actually appeal to the working class. Uh, I'm, I'm more concerned with the working class than I am with these old tribal markers because I think everyone smart realizes that they're not very useful guides for sort of understanding friend-enemy distinctions in politics today. Mm -hmm. In terms of um, the, the apparent classes, so they're the classes that are presented to us rather than the, the, more, the more classical Marxist analysis where you, know, you actually focus on class rather than whatever schisms are, are, are shoved in our face today. You know, that's, that's actually kind of an interesting point to bring up because in some ways, as a quote unquote stress right now, bold, fascist, whatever, like you get this thrown in your face a lot in, in that, well, you've abandoned traditional Marxism for, I don't know, if they're generous, they would say some sort of barbarian conception of class. But that's not really it at all. For, for us uh, in the Örebro party and sort of formerly left Marxist, populists, whatever. We have a fairly orthodox view of things. To us, like the big thing today, the big class conflict that the left is terminally unable to even name is one between people who are not necessarily exploited in the classical sense. To be an exploited worker, the marker of that is not earning a salary from a boss. It's actually um, being exploited at the point of production. So essentially, you produce things, you have a capitalist who appropriates your surplus value. Um, and the class base of the left today is people who tend to be reliant on economic transfers. So to take an example, like say a general in, in Hitler's army, like that guy is not being exploited. He's paid a salary, but it's not sort, sort of like capitalist exploitation. Like you can't really say that, oh, well, you know, if capitalism wasn't a thing, we would be able to do twice the number of war crimes on the Eastern Front. But like we're sort of held back by the evils of capitalism. No, obviously there's production going on in the German economy, but the, pro the productive workers produce for themselves and a surplus and parts of that surplus is then transferred over to like Prussian officers in the officer corps. And that's like, I, I'm kind of getting in the weeds here, but, but it's an important distinction because Marx posited the universal class as a class that has 
this self-interest in abolishing exploitation because they're being exploited. Mm -hmm. Leftists today tend to rely on sort of transfers from other parts of the productive economy. And for us, sort of formerly left populists, this is a hugely important point that I think if Marx were alive today, he would agree on. Like we, we kind of pretend like people who sort of rely on NGOs that are funded by billionaires or rely on sort of mandated transfers by the state. So the state goes in and says, well, we have to fund this and this workshop, that these people are actually sort of proletarians, but they're not. And their interests kind of uh, oppose um, the, the productive workers. And this kind of ties into, uh, if you're familiar with it, Turchin's thesis on elite overproduction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I'm, I'm, I think in, in this area with, with kind of this, this Marxist class analysis, a, a place where I find myself a bit lost at the moment is um, who is who is who are the the working class the, the who is the worker in the, in the current you know constellation in the west because you kind of have this this underclass that's been subsidized you know they they kind of maybe dip in and out of work but they're mostly out out of work then you have this kind of service economy sector is is that the working class at the moment because you know factory jobs and all this stuff is, is not really uh, and then you have kind of have these strata of pmcs and then you have you know the elites on top so what what does this pyramid look like yeah, this is actually kind of a thing where I think the left does a fair bit of projection where they say that, well, you know, nobody else is really doing class analysis, only we are. And, you know, a nurse is a worker and, uh, and you know, like everyone who's not a billionaire is a worker. Well, Marx kind of talked about people who approach the sort of productive economy purely from the, in the perspective of a, of a consumer. That does not necessarily mean that the person is some sort of evil parasite. To take an example, a doctor, let's say, is not necessarily involved in like actual production of commodities, but is socially useful. And also at some point also useful for the circulation of capital, like if workers are dropping like flies, you have a problem. And then you kind of move from that to people who are probably socially useful, however society decides on that, but maybe less sort of tied up in, in the circulation of capital. And then you have people who are probably not socially useful at all and who are not implicated in uh, the circulation of capital at all. So a diversity consultant or whatever at, in, at Alphabet. And um, to me, for me, like the, I still, I still believe the old ways are kind of best. Like the old analysis of a worker as someone who is actually exploited in, in the true sense. And so a lot of exploitation in, in the world economy has obviously been moved to sort of Southeast Asia and so on. Um, and you have this huge service sector, but, but if I'm wearing my political rather than analytical hat here for a second, I think there's a huge difference in interest between these sort of, um, like a nurse, for example, I don't think is sort of politically opposed to some sort of egalitarian project or sort of anti-elite project or a project aimed at um, flattening sort of inequalities and so on. This does not necessarily hold true in practice, if not in theory, for people who are highly educated, who live in the sort of urban metropoles, um, like coastal cities in the US, and who are very reliant on this sort of invisible workforce of illegal aliens and so on to sort of uh, feather their nests and make their um, ever more precarious upper middle class lifestyle possible. Like these people have very different, um, they have very different interests. So I guess it depends on what level you wanna talk about. Like in the, in the sort of 
analytical sense, while the working class is smaller, but it still obviously exists even in the West, and it's not necessarily smaller in, in other parts of the world, because what's happening is that people who are subsistence farmers and so on are being transformed into proletarians in Africa and parts of Asia and so on. But in terms of the political conflicts in the West, I think you're seeing a conflict between people who are, to, to use the sort of Turchin term here, the people who are necessary to sort of uh, support the lifestyle of the elite and the sort of overproduced elites themselves. Like that's sort of the major political conflict today. Mm -hmm. And the the left is trying to, I mean, it's trying, seceding to, um, to kind of either import or, uh, you know, consolidate their position with, with the people who probably are most represented in, in the service sector economy, like which is, you know, through immigration, that's, that's kind of a, a you know, it, it, I feel like that's where the, the kind of the class dynamic breaks down because there's, there's much less leverage in, in the, uh, in this kind of disjointed working class of the service sector economy. If, if they're essentially the second they come in, they're a serf class to whatever leftist interests have, have brought them in. Um, oh yeah, definitely. I mean, this has been known for, for a fairly long time that it's harder to organize people if they're sort of divided by culture and can't even speak the same language and so on. Yeah. Um, and, and so what you find with the left, and they just got tranced in, in the UK, like Labour had this, uh, this sort of, what do they call it? Like a municipality, essentially, called Hartlepool. And the Tories just smashed them up, something fierce. Um, and this was kind of a red wall district, one of the few that didn't fall in 2019. Um, the only reason it didn't fall is because the Brexit party was still a thing. And so sort of the vote was split between the Tories and, and the Brexit party. Now that the Brexit party is gone, Labour has just been completely eradicated. And the what's happening is that Leftists will just say, oh, well, you know, these people are too stupid to know their own interests, blah, 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 blah. Like, we have a class politics for these people, but they're too ungrateful and gammon and racist and so on. But this is just ridiculous at this point. Like, it's the year of our Lord, 2021, and people still pretend that the left does not have a class project on its own. Like, it's just bumbling around like, uh, a cartoon animal in Looney Tunes and like there's no sort of malice inherent when it picks up the big mallet and smashes someone like it's just gorge I don't know but the problem is that the left does have a class project which the working class is obviously wise to and that anyone with eyes to see can really perceive and that is a class project for the sort of precarious people who are at constant risk of failing in the sort of middle class, upper middle class curses honorium, mm -hmm. and who risk sliding downwards, having to stock shelves at Walmart, though they are incredibly educated and they've done everything right. Like, imagine the horror of them having to work side by side with the workers that they so love. <laughs> it has to be prevented. Then that is what a lot of these sort of, um, a lot of these leftist quote unquote cultural ideas that alienate people really boil down to. Like scratch a leftist cultural, culture war position and you will find a jobs program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that reminds me of the the, the very uh, popular book, um, kind of what was it, Aut automated luxury communism, which I feel like uh, uh, summarizes the 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 project in a way best. It's the idea that you know you can't fail if if you know, everything's been provided for you at the level expected by the now the current upper middle class and you know more whatever if if asteroid mining goes through. Um, it's, I'm curious what you, what you think about that position, kind of the, 
the the ultimate techno utopian leftism of the of the youth look i i think that these people need to be destroyed and like <laughs> alex jones i have to amend that with you know politically or as the kids would say in minecraft uh but they have to be destroyed like this sort of utopianism is just covering up for the fact that the entire role of the working class in this schema is to feather the nests of these completely useless parasitical elites. And if they fail, well, then we have to import, well, we can't really import immigrants because they won't solve it in the long term. So we'll replace immigrants with robots. Then we'll all live like kings, like trust fund kids. And you know, uh, if this is socialism, then you know, put me in a pair of lederhosen and call me Heinrich Himmler. I'm not really interested in that. I think that um, all of the this techno utopianism speaks to a actual resignation. Like this is what losers talk about. Like this sort of. Uh, last minute deus ex machina, like literally in this case, uh, that will uh, provide them with this ideal society where nobody will have to work and so on. It's, it, it hasn't really caught on among the working class for obvious reasons, because it doesn't offer them anything. Um, and and like all of these sort of dreams about UBI and so on, uh, to me, that sounds like a total nightmare. Because again, power in that society will be completely concentrated in the people who decide, who control the UBI. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and you see this with leftists, like they, they really let the mask slip a lot of the time. They say that, well, you know, in this society where nobody has to work or, you know, people work, but uh, some panel of experts sort of shifts resources around to uh, where they're most needed. They then obviously imply that they will be the experts. And, you know, there's a real sinister undertone to this because at, at some point people start talking about like, we can't really have racists in our NHS. Like if you're a racist, maybe you shouldn't get medical care. And, you know, that's, that's really good that you're doing all of these things for, uh, for a good cause. But then again, every monster thinks he has, is acting in a good cause, generally speaking. So again, um, the left program is properly aristocratic in, in the sense that it's, it's focused on a few experts who now sort of rant and rave like kids who, who put in a quarter in a, in a vending machine and are just shaking with anger that they can't get their can of lemon lime uh, soda. Uh, and they're going like, they're hitting the machine and going like, why won't you work, stupid thing? Why won't you give us the votes, you stupid gammon racists? <laughs> but I mean, like, people aren't vending machines. Like, they're not to be instrumentalized in that way. That's what I think as some sort of old style Marxist, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I, I completely agree with that. And to me, it's it's very heartening to see what's what's been going on. I mean, it's... Uh, it was it was quite hard to expect that people wouldn't wouldn't notice this huge you know um, yeah essentially construction of this new left against the the interests of the uh, the biggest chunk of the population up to this point um, but I think you met, you mentioned something really interesting uh, I read a piece by you that said that uh, uh, Im immigrants in in Sweden I think immigrant women in Sweden were more likely to vote for the uh, so-called racist anti-immigrant Sweden Democrats rather than the uh, the left party which is a quite quite interesting situation like what uh, what uh, what gives uh, how come this uh, this exotic uh, political structure in Sweden. I mean, it's, that's, that's kind of the thing where we're in the year of our Lord 2021 and we kind of have a good reason to sort of stop pretending it's very exotic. Because again, like the left party, this is all about class. The left party uh, appeals to people who are middle class, 
like who make more than the average or more educated than the average. And these are the people who sort of need uh, Guatemalan or I don't know, Polish nannies and so on. Um, and who need those people to have as low wages as possible because again, they're feeling the squeeze from above and so they're reliant on increasing the exploitation on the people below them. Um, and a lot of newly arrived immigrants are, and, and I know this is a huge shock, but they're not really um, well positioned to take advantage of this sort of uh, upper middle class lifestyle. They tend to have less education than the norm in general, and they tend to have less assets, which means that they can't really go to a car wash staffed by sort of illegal immigrants living in a basement. They have to wash their own cars and or they're going to be employed by a car wash. And if you're employed by a car wash, you kind of have an interest in making sure the wages are rising rather than falling. Mm -hmm. And so this sort of entire uh, hierarchical structure, uh, it's really not to their benefit. Yeah. And, and, and again, like this is, this is a pattern that repeats itself. If you just think for one second about how the left has, in, in the UK especially, has chosen to define the issue of uh, European Union membership as a culture war issue. Mm -hmm. Please, like the European Union, it's not some sort of, I don't know, a, a fan fiction sort of community where you can ship different characters in Star Trek Voyager and so on. Like the EU is a huge political slash economic um, superstructure that has huge effects on um, sort of how legislation um, can be uh, passed, what sort of rules, what sort of economic models a country has available to them. Like it defines a lot of things that are very, very easily seen as political and economic. And yet the left uh, always says that, oh, well, these workers, they've been fooled by culture war issues. Uh, I don't know, they, they just don't like the EU because of some random subjective perception. Is the left truly so stupid as to not understand that the European Court of Justice is actually a court with jurisdiction over the membership member states? Obviously not. Like they they pretend to not notice because to notice that would be to say, well, okay, so we have this political economic formation, and some people are winners and some people are losers, and there's a sort of material political conflict here. If you acknowledge that conflict, well, you kind of have to show your cards, as they say. You kind of have to say, well, we benefit from this structure in these ways. Mm -hmm. And the moment that happens, the dastardly Boris Johnson can just tell some gammon racist worker in like the North of England that, well, okay, these people, they benefit from the EU, but you lose. And we can't have that now, can we? Yeah. We don't want any materialism in our culture war now, would we? Exactly. And do you think the kind of the, the fact that the, the narrative side of this, you know, the culture war side of this has reached such a, just an absurd fever pitch, is this um, avoidance of, of actually trying, you know, actually looking at the material reality of things and the fact that, you know, things are, things are very, very, very far down the line with things, you know, with the European Union, with, with you know, super, super national globalized structures in general, you know, it's not just, it's not just Europe. Um, well, I mean, I, I would sort of push back a little bit on that. Um, I think it's more complicated. People who have, you know the saying, right? Like you can't really convince someone of something if their entire salary hinges on not getting it. Mm -hmm. And the people who say, well, okay, this is all about culture or cultural Marxism. 
these are the people who whose salary indirectly or directly in some cases really depend on them never really getting it and so every sort of leftist and most of these sort of liberal slash marxist slash populist substack uh, writers podcasters and so on they have to be fairly circumspect about this because they still belong to this class segment and you know they really don't want to be ostracized fully uh, but if you look at people who ha are politically ambitious on the right these are not people who say oh no please get those marxist cooties away from me i've found uh, that they are very eager students of anything uh, whether it be Marxism or cliodynamics or whatever else that can help them not only understand what's going on, not only understand the world, but also to change it, to borrow from Marx. Like these people are not ones you have to convince that there's a material basis behind this quote unquote culture war. So there's not really much resistance there as far as I can tell. Um, and yeah. the resistance you do find tend to be older institutions like the Heritage Foundation and so on. TPUSA is kind of split because, but like if you follow the money, you soon see like why they're hesitant. But, but it's mostly the left that tries to keep this myth alive. Like it's not really alive in the, in the eyes of the voters, I would say, because I mean, um, one of the most gratifying things in the last few years um, and you kind of get tired after a while of saying I told you so because like the first 12 or 15 times there's something novel about it but afterwards it kind of gets boring but being able to say well okay we predicted this in terms of where actual working class voters would move so away from these quote unquote protectors uh, in, in these left parties who then say, well, you know, we really have to divert more taxpayer money to funding uh, a new institute for uh, studying Latinx people's colonial uh, um, oppression and gendered bodies and so on. Like, they're moving away from that towards people who are not necessarily uh, real conservatives. They don't care about that one jot. What they do care about is actually talking about material issues, by and large. And again, even like all of this trans crap that people say, well, this is the heart of the culture war. There's no, nothing um, objective about any of this. Like this is just purely subjective in the realm of political metaphysics or whatever. No, it's really not. Um, one of the things that has happened over the last, say, 10 years, in terms of who gets money from the Ford Foundation, if you're a lesbian, like, you, you might as well be some sort of neo-Nazi, like, you're shut out. So the pie has not grown that much, I would say, but all of this sort of politicking around inside of the LGBTQIAA plus whatever coalition. It's actually people battling with knives drawn over who gets the money from Bill and Melinda Gates. Whatever happens to that money tap now, well, it's an open question, but um, even this part of the culture war that seems so sort of unrelated from real world or issues. No, there's actually a fierce battle over resources. Here. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing is, at, at one point, you know, the, the, the battle starts, uh, you know, it can start anywhere, it can start over resources, but then it also kind of gets a, it develops a mind of its own. And the thing is, the, the crumbling uh, husk that is the media, it essentially just runs on things like this, you know, it kind of has to, has to not only up the ante itself, but look around for anyone who is upping the ante and just, you know, build whatever uh, remnants of a business model it has on, on that. Yeah, I would say that living in Sweden has had its benefits because we had sort of a, an early um, 
we were in some ways, I thought rather foolishly at the time when I didn't see the whole picture, I thought we were the patient zero for wokeness. And in some limited way we were, but uh, because this country was really crazy around like 2014, 15 with like the whole refugee crisis and so on. So we had the same like how to be an anti-racist and we need to kick out like white bodies from gendered spaces and blah, 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 blah. And then the, the refugee crisis came and it was sort of like a, a mass psychosis in a way. People who pointed out, like there was a dentist on, on Gotland, I think, who was tasked with doing sort of dental imaging on refugees that came that didn't have their identification papers. And obviously nobody did, they all lost it on the way because if you couldn't prove your identification, you could easily say, well, I'm under 18, so you gotta let me stay. And so he sort of looked at some of these sort of dental images and said, like, this guy is not a day under 40. Like, he's not 60 years old. That guy who said this got sort of fired and then doxxed and threatened with, like, being killed and so on. So, so it was kind of like this whole people, what you see in the U.S. today with people having rebaptisms and so on on George Floyd Square and seeing, you know, blood crying from statues and all of that crap. Like we, we had that in Sweden, but to tie this with what you said about the media, the thing that really helped me center the, the role of transfers and people dependent on transfers as the sort of one of the main conflicts of our age was actually how this insane frenzy petered out in Sweden because it's, it's, it's really died down. I always thought that Sweden would go lead the charge, but the things going on in the US today are, are on another level, like cold civil war, as someone put it. It's, it's on, on that level. While in Sweden, everyone's kind of, you know, mellowed out a whole lot. And one of the reasons I think for that is because Sweden has a institutionalized system where the state takes on a huge responsibility for making sure that these transfers actually work. So to take the media as the ground zero for all of this crap, um, in Sweden, you have both state media, which employs directly a significant proportion of all the journalists in the country. And then you, the state also goes in and supports like directly um, the bottom line of papers. So I, 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 I served briefly on the board of some sort of leftoid um, newspaper in an earlier life. And you know, much of that, uh, to, to be sort of a revolutionary leftist that says you have to abolish the, the capitalist roadsters in the Swedish state. Like, yeah, uh, to write that, you first write an application to the Swedish state saying, well, could you give us money to run this newspaper saying that we need to abolish the Swedish state? Thank you very much. And they will give you the money to do that. And without that money, uh, nobody bothers. Like, uh, so this is in stark contrast to the US where there's no real protections of that kind. The federal government doesn't go in and say, well, we're gonna uh, sort of act as a backstop for every sort of struggling newspaper in the country. And we're gonna directly employ like 20% of our journalists or whatever. No, you have to sort of um, stand there with your hat in your hand on the porch of Jeff Bezos and that's why the politics is so much more um, visceral. Like in Sweden, people could just go, oh, well, our cultural revolution is over. Red guards go home. Because at the end of the day, when the red guards did go home, the state stepped in and made sure that these precarious elites didn't fall too fast, too far. Mm -hmm. so that doesn't exist in the US, which means that the red guards, they can't go home. Mm. Yeah, there's um, 
I feel like, you know, the, this shift away from, from classical, I mean, classical, you know, typical Republican GOP politics, which is just, you know, free market libertarian uh, on the one hand and, you know, confusingly socially conservative on the other hand, like these two aren't in, in the stark contrast, um, is starting to, to, to break down. Um, but I also think it's because people are starting to see with the rise of companies like Amazon and, you know, with these behemoths like Jeff Bezos, that there is not that much of a difference between the state at that scale and companies at that scale. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and to, at the moment, they seem to be like this many headed hydra, like they're, they, they're definitely working in concert on many levels. I mean, you could see that from anything from, you know, um, internet censure or, uh, yeah, just, just a way regulation works. It's, 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 it's pretty, it's pretty shocking at the, the level of, um, coherence that they've that they've gotten to so i think that's also a reason why people don't really buy the libertarian shtick about oh it's it's just a you know it's a free market it's a it's a private company one of the most telling things in, in relation to that was during the lockdowns um which are not completely over but they're sort of being tampered down in the states um there was this brief sort of leftist flashpoint around like small businesses where some people with like incredibly heterodox sort of arches I guess went out and said well maybe if we smash all of uh, Main Street America for these for Walmart and Amazon and so on to just take over every fucking convenience store and bookshop and whatever, like speciality video store, you name it, that will actually not be an unalloyed good. And everyone was like, oh, how can you say that? The petit, petit bourgeoisie, like, haven't you read Marx, blah, 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 like this, we're leftists, we have to be on the side of the Republic of Walmart. And this was kind of a big thing for all of these fucking talking heads to sort of like the, the amount of scholasticism in these quote unquote political circles will never really cease to amaze me. Uh, all of these people, including people who are good or great thinkers or have quote unquote good politics, they talk endlessly like uh, medieval scholastics discussing how many angels could dance on the head of a pin, but like whether actually Main Street should survive. And this shows you how out of touch these people are with actual like practical politics. Because if you have any sort of constituency, any sort of relationship to politics as it actually works, people with names and addresses that go to you to solve their problems, you kind of realize that uh, there's, there's no end to uh, the um, potential for you to win votes among sort of small business owners, not because they're all, you know, part of the universal class, but because um, they don't really have an interest in being stomped with a uh, steel jackboot in the face by Jeff Bezos. And a lot of this happens through the state essentially using its, its, its muscles to favor the big fish at the expense of the small. So in one particularly egregious example from the States, you have this rule where like, and, and none of this is sort of passed into law. It's just municipalities doing whatever the fuck they feel like. Uh, but like you can't have a tea store, speciality tea store open because you know, tea is not a vital commodity. If you're just going to the store to get some tea, that's you being a like killing grandma. So the tea store has to be closed. But if you go to Walmart and only put tea uh, in your you know, shopping cart, that's totally fine. Walmart can keep open and Walmart can keep selling tea. It's just that we can't sell tea from these tea stores because that's you know, killing grandma. Um, the state is not a neutral arbiter here. So anyone who says, well, okay, maybe we should not let the state use its sort of power to crush um, the tea store on Main Street. 
Like you don't need some bullshit going back to the text 200 years ago in some letter between uh, um, Marx and someone else discussing the grain prices in East London to sort of discern like, oh, well, what can we do about this? No, it's really quite simple. If you say, well, I promise to prevent the state from smashing your face in, well, then you have an alliance of convenience. But like this was an impossible thing for leftists, obviously, to grasp, which was quite interesting. Because for, for the Örebro party, this is one of the things that sort of happened to us. We had this municipality where, of Örebro where the party is active. And um, the municipal council essentially said that, okay, well, we're going to raise the sort of fees of having like outdoor dining by 200% this year. And we were the only party that said, well, you know, there's a huge crisis threatening the survival of these restaurants and so on. Maybe we shouldn't uh, raise the municipal tariffs or, or fees. And the pro-business party was like, oh, well, you know, you, you can't just suggest su stuff like that out of the blue. They totally dropped the ball. We said, no, like, come on. Maybe we can raise the fees after this insanely destructive pandemic is over. How about that? And suddenly you have all of these restaurant owners saying, you know, this part isn't so bad. This is often how politics works. Um, um, again, what you're seeing with these big companies a lot of the time is that these are companies, the, the sort of conflict between productive in some sense and non-productive segments of society runs through a lot of these woke corporations as well. Because if you think about Silicon Valley, who tend to be almost completely on, on the side of the Democrats in terms of donations and so on, a lot of these companies really do not have a business model. They don't produce anything. Uber, uh, which recently spun off its um, sort of uh, artificial or self-driving car division, which means that the company is now well and truly doomed. But it's a taxi company uh, who has, through the power of marketing and bribing politicians, convinced everyone that, well, it's actually sort of a disruptive thing. It's this sort of technological breakthrough to redefine workers as contractors. Like that is literally the only sort of margins that Uber hopes to squeeze out, which is to say, I'm not going to pay my drivers what taxi companies pay. Like apps, get the fuck out of here. Every fucking taxi company these days has an app. Yeah. So it's it's not really it's not really a company that is designed to push the envelope in 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 terms of the productive economy. No, this is this is Roman tax farmers essentially. Um, if you you're familiar with that sort of thing, what tax farmers used to do. No, no, don't tell, tell me about it. Well, I mean, tax farming is is a thing that you see like all of history's greatest his, hits. So late 1800s France, tax farmers galore. Uh, uh, Roman Empire, tax farmers galore. Tax farming is essentially the state selling um, the rights to collect taxes from this or this sort of population to a private company for a lump sum. And then the company goes out and collects the taxes. And, you know, whatever differences in the official sort of tax rate and what they collect, they get to keep for themselves. So what happens is that these tax farmers essentially um, uh, wring people dry. They go around and they hire mercenaries and they collect the tax three times per week or something. And they say, well, you know, you don't have a receipt you can't prove to me that I've already collected the taxes. So how about you pay them again, or I get my friend with the halberd to run you through. And you know, this is really great um, 
for enriching certain private interests and for destroying your own economy. Like that's what happens inevitably. You destroy your own economy by essentially doing swiddening, sort of slash and burn agriculture on it. And Uber is the same thing. You're through sort of legal ma machinations, um, basically circumventing labor laws and um, transferring money from sort of workers who will then spend it at, you know, I don't know, buying Funko Pops or whatever, and uh, transferring it to people in Silicon Valley. Like that's the only thing that's going on. The only sort of innovation. Like tax farming is always an innovation when people rediscover it. And these people, like these companies, that the fact the fact that they're in the tank for the Democrats is it shouldn't be surprising, because um, it stands to reason that there should be a sort of class conflict between um, capitalists who are sort of um, engaged in the productive economy and capitalists or sort of rentiers rather. Um, because, I mean, this conflict has always existed in various forms. And also in terms of, if you look at small businesses, they used to be sort of um, fairly loyal foot soldiers for fascism, because in, the, um, in, in Europe during the 20th century, if you were a small business owner, the major threat you faced was one from below, because you are a small business owner, you are part of the petty capital, you are less effective in terms of, you know, squeezing out surplus value and so on. You have lesser margins to work with. So if there's huge unionization drives and workers saying, well, I'm not gonna work more than seven hours a day, that hits you much more than the Daimler-Benz factory. And so for small business owners at that point, like the big enemy was workers below them. Today, that doesn't really hold true because first of all, unions are not really a thing in a lot of places. And um, again, if you, if you think a, a few moments about why the left is so eager to sort of destroy every mom and pop store uh, in the country in the name of socialism, well, you know, those mom and pop stores are never gonna be effective enough to hire some sort of, you know, priest essentially of diversity. Some university educated functionary bureaucrat commissar who sort of uh, puts out a lot of PowerPoint presentations about like becoming Latinx or whatever. Like they don't have the money. Walmart and Amazon are effective enough because they squeeze their workers more a lot of the time that sure, they can hire the gender fluid commissars. Mom and pop stores can't. And so the kulaks, they have to be destroyed. Meaning that in terms of like political coalitions that you can expect to see, um, because again, like these commissars, they suck the blood of like working people as well through the redirection of taxpayer money and so on you know, from, I don't know, social security or building a road to <sighs> paying for therapy. Therapy is infrastructure too, as Elizabeth Warren tells us. Like this sort of alliance between uh, working class people, some segments of like um, um, the hot bourgeoisie, like high capital, and the majority of small business owners who cannot pay for this uh, elite overproduction is what you're going to see. And, and the Tories, they're heading in that direction. And the Republicans will head in that direction. Um, because again, in politics, it's not your ideas that really matter. It's, it's what sort of circumstances you find yourself in. Mm. Yeah, and, and and what coalitions you can represent in a in a yeah in a substantive way. Uh, so, do you is is your feeling that the the future of the the Republican Party, if it is to have a future, has to be in the direction of this um, this Nazbol populism <laughs> that that so it's so darkly coming out of these uh, echo chambers of the internet. 
Yeah, I mean, look, I, I don't really put much stock in these echo chambers on the internet. Like, at some point a couple of years ago, you could sort of troll for some, some interesting tidbits, bits of analysis and so on. This was before Substack, but there were some blogs and so on. You know, Moldbog got his start there and there were like some, in the real intellectual desert it was 2016. You could go to Jacobite, say, and, and read some really interesting stuff, even though a lot of it was just sort of esoteric garbage. But what I find often is that all of these free-floating intellectuals have the same sort of, um, they have the same sort of limitation that they've also failed the middle upper class cursus in Orium. And so they're embarking on this very well worn path of becoming some sort of rabble rousing millenarian prophet. And you know, at this point, like you can read something like American Affairs and you will find actual sort of professionals, people who engage with politics, not just as something in, in the world of ideas or metaphysics or millenarian like wishful thinking. Um, and so what you're seeing today is that like a lot of these people, so you know, can't bought people who are quote unquote big on Twitter, um, they're being progressively phased out. And, you know, thank God for that. Um, like, I don't have anything about against them personally in, in some cases. But, like, politics is not really, this is what, what hits you when you sort of actually start working with, po like, in politics coming out of this sort of leftist youth movement uh, cult cultish environment. Like you start talking to voters about, you know, we have to have proletarian worldwide revolution. And they go, yeah, that doesn't mean shit to me. I'm sorry, but the parking meters in this neighborhood need to be fixed. And you do this huge double take, you go like, what? <laughs> Dude, I'm here talking about worldwide uh, proletarian revolution, and you're saying that you care about parking meters in your neighborhood not working. And they go, yeah. And then if you are smart, you eventually go, huh, wow. Politics, it's not actually about me. It's about other people. I am a servant. I am not actually a master. And so, you know, this insight among sort of the, the internet set is, uh, it's, it's quite rare, let's just say. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's less fun, <laughs> less fun than to, uh, you know, pontificate. Pontificating is, you know, about probably at least 60% of Twitter, the rest is porn. Um, I'm, I'm curious what you think happened to, to, to the anti-globalization movement. Because that that used to be the left. I mean, except for you know some some veganism and some some you know um, socks with sandals and stuff like that. But it used to be quite highly driven by by this fervent anti global globalist uh, sentiment. And then almost overnight, at least that that's what it felt to me. It uh, it flipped. Where, where did it go? Did it just get um, channeled into into more uh, kind of neoliberal productive uh, energies? Let me respond with a metaphor. Um, I was watching this virtual 4chan football cup where all the different sort of boards on 4chan have a virtual football tournament against each other. And some, like one of the commentators said, you know, this 40-year-old boomer meme, it's cropped up a lot of times recently. Where did it come from? And the other commentator says, hmm, maybe it has something to do with the fact that everyone who posts on Fortune today has posted for like 10 years, and they're all 40 years old or older at this point. And what I want to sort of put a finger on with that awkward metaphor, it's just that all of these people in the anti-globalist movement, they're still with us, by and large. 
while they were uh, happy anti-globalists, they were teenagers. They were passing through the cursus honorium of a Western elite, which always has, you know, fucking, the, the former chief of the CIA voted for, you know, the American Communist Party in his youth. So, like, this, this is normal. Mm. So you have this period of, uh, you know, reclaim the streets, rage against the machine, fuck you, I won't do what you tell me, etc., etc., etc. And then you're supposed to transition away from making bombs for the weather underground to working at Goldman Sachs. Yeah, or Raytheon. Yeah, and that never happened for this generation. And so what happens is that everyone goes, oh, well, you know, we, we have to abandon this dumb uh, anti-globalism thing because we're not teenagers anymore. But also, like, we're... You see this a lot on Twitter, you know, 44 year old women saying like, as a young woman, like, you're not really that young. Like, come on, I'm a millennial too. But so, sort of at some point, you kind of have to leave this young adult world behind. Like, people aren't going to write a coming of age novel about you, let's just say. But, but this is, this is uh, indicative of the fact that these people haven't moved the, along the curse of And in this, at, like in this sort of situation, what happens to them is that they go, holy crap, Bill and Melinda Gates, help me, help me, help me. Ford Foundation, where are the, where are the burgers? And so you have this sort of politics today, which is very protective of all of these various um, patronage schemes and um, various subsidies and so on for people um, who are sort of elites on the make. You know, they're heading somewhere. Like they might be 46 year old and sort of getting out of their umpteen intern internship. But like any day now, they're going to complete the curse of Sonorium and become like just like their boomer parents. And no, that's by and large, that's not going to happen. But again, what happens when you have elite overproduction is that the stakes get, ra get raised into the stratosphere. And then usually you have like civil war or some other catastrophe where um, the surplus elite is winnowed down. But Again, like these people had to abandon anti-globalism because anti-globalism was something that was persuasive at the point where they were still living with their parents, literally in many cases. And so the sort of economic imperatives were not really being felt in the same way back then. Mm, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. It, it, it is interesting how the almost the in, entire flame of it just went out the window and was replaced by, in a way, kind of the opposite, the idea that, you know, any almost any criticism of globalization or, you know, porous borders or, you know, open borders is, is equivalent to, to, I don't know, 1930s Germany, and you're just about to just about to, you know, start putting on your jackboots. Um, it's, uh, it, it is interesting kind of how, how fast it shifted. Um, do you think that that was an kind of an organic instinct of this class to shift or was it influenced either by, by academia or I don't know, maybe some, um, um, cause, cause it is, it is the, the most um, iron narrative that we're confronted with right now. It, it really does put a, a damper on what you can say about the space. You know, like you could see, you know, Angela Nagel got it just by saying that there is quite a good case to be made for for uh, uh, you know closing the border as as uh, a leftist. Uh, so it's um, yeah, it, it feels like not only did it shift, but it shifted and then it closed the door with like seven locks that you can't even question it. Yeah, I mean, again, uh, at some point, sort of the novelty of all of this ought to wear off because with Angela Nagel, for example, what she argued was quite simple, simply that 
Well, if you're a person being um, hit by uh, increasing sort of a loose labor supply rather than like a tight labor pool, this is going to have a downward pressure on wages. And also, you know, it's harder to organize if you have, if people can't speak the same language and et cetera, et cetera. And you have leftists who say, oh, well, no, this is not a problem at all. Like, why would this be relevant in any way? And none of them work in, in fields of work where they're feeling the competition. Again, at some points, at some point, you kind of have to go, well, this is not really, like, this is not really a mystery what has happened here. Like, if you find someone, um, you know, shot 10 times in the head in a burnt out car, um, like the coroner, when he's faced with the question, is this a murder or is this a suicide? Like, okay, well, maybe he shot himself the first time, but it's hard to shoot yourself 10 times and then, you know, set fire to your own car. This is probably not him doing all of that by himself. And so for the left, like, are they just stupid or are they going or are they acting according to their class interests? Like, at this point, I think we should not really extend the benefit of the doubt here. The left has a class project, and it's, it's kind of humorous in a way, where they're like the emp emperor with no clothes. Like, everyone kind of sees that the guy is naked. And everyone's like, no, 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 th these are the finest imported silks from Venice, like, oh my God, like, oh, what a regal dress. And, and everyone's just kind of playing along because it's, it's awkward otherwise. And then someone comes in and says, you know, why is that guy naked? And, and ruins it for everyone. So, so again, leftists are by and large very aware of it, but constantly the fact that there's no workers left in the workers movement and that they're all just saying openly that my worst nightmare is actually having to work alongside a plumber or something. That would be horrible. I belong in the university. And again, are we supposed to go, well, oh, Sherlock Holmes, please resolve this mystery. Like, what, what are the class forces working here? Like, this, 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 this boggles the mind. Well, does it really? It, it, it's all out in the open at this point. Yeah, yeah, increasingly. Um, and I think, you know, the, the fact that it's, it's ratcheting up and the, the just, just the nature of the discourse. I mean, maybe, maybe I spend too much time in it. I mean, to me, it seems absurd, but uh, I feel like there are more and more people are, are glomming onto the fact that it is absurd. I mean, you can see this in, in the, the latest UK elections. I think the absurdity has, uh, you know, seeped through to, to multiple class interests. So they, they, they kind of understand what's, what's going on and I'm happy to see it. Um, before I, I let you go, I want to ask you the question of the show, which is, um, do you have a thinker or writer, either in politics or whatever fields that, uh, that you know, you find inspirational, um, a subversive thinker that you think deserves a bit more uh, limelight that people should know about, that people should read? Uh, I mean, I think the most formative thinker on me is kind of a, a, a odd figure for, for someone of my political persuasion, let's say. It's this American former or arch druid named Michael Greer um, and he's actually a v fairly interesting guy like very into into like magic esoteric studies and so on but he had this old blog called arch druid report which really in some ways was even earlier than Peter Tarchin and calling out like where the US was headed. And he um, is, I guess, he describes himself as a Berkey and conservative. And I think his sort of perspective on, in, on history as essentially cyclical and 
um, the the idea that you actually need to sort of study what has happened before if you want to make predictions at, uh, about what will happen in the future um, is a guy I would recommend for anyone who who really wants to sort of see all angles, I guess. Mm, so it's, it's Michael Greer, and is it is his blog still up? I think there's an archive of it if you search for the arch. Arch Druid Report. Arch Druid Report. Okay, that's interesting. I, I haven't heard of him, but I'll, I'll check it out. Um, yeah, before before I let you go definitively, I want to ask you, is there any place that I should point people towards that people should check out any work that you want to, to let people know about? Um, I mean, I, I write occasionally, and most of it is sort of scattered in different places, but I'm writing another piece for American Affairs, and then a piece after that, actually. So there's definitely one coming out in the spring issue now, and then maybe one in the summer issue. Other than that, well, I mean, I sometimes appear on the, the podcast Good Old Boys, and they're, they're well, they're good old boys. You, you, it says so right on the tin. So I can definitely recommend that podcast. Uh, not only if you want to listen to me more, but but also if you want to listen to my comrades, Marek and Bogbeef, who are cool guys. Yeah, definitely recommend the the Good Old Boys podcast myself. Marek and Bogbeef are are real real boys. I like them. Cool. Well, this was a, a pleasure. Yeah. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you for coming on. <laughs>